Hello everyone and welcome to my review of the first Batman film directed by Joel Schumacher, which is Batman Forever. Let's talk about the film, shall we? So the story shows Batman, played by Val Kilmer, suiting up as Two-Face, played by Tommy Lee Jones, has a security guard tied up as a hostage trying to bait Batman. Once Batman shows up, we see Dr. Chase Meridian, played by Nicole Kidman, who needless to say has a crush on Batman. Eventually, Batman saves the security guard from a safe full of boiling acid. However, in the process, Two-Face manages to escape. The very next day, we head to Wayne Enterprises, where we are introduced to Edward Nigma, played by Jim Carrey, whose project is rejected by Bruce Wayne as it deals with brain manipulation. And of course, he doesn't take it well, as he's been sending Bruce Wayne a bunch of riddles. We also see a brief flashback of Two-Face, who is the district attorney of Gotham City named Harvey Dent, who, while convicting a mob boss, Batman tried to save him, but the mob boss threw acid on his face, which left him horribly scarred and apparently made him insane. Well, Bruce Wayne's taking Chase Meridian to the circus where we see the Flying Graysons, including Richard or Dick Grayson, played by Chris O'Donnell. And while the show's going on, Two-Face pops up and takes everyone hostage and plans on blowing up the building, unless if someone tells him who Batman is. While Dick Grayson manages to throw the bomb in the nearest lake, his family winds up falling to their deaths at the hands of Two-Face, where Commissioner Gordon puts him in Bruce Wayne's care, but of course he wants revenge on Two-Face. Eventually, Edward Digma chooses to become the Riddler and teams up with Two-Face. Two-Face wants to just kill Batman, but the Riddler takes a very different approach and plans on putting his device he calls the box in every home in Gotham in order to steal their secrets. As the film progresses, we see Dick Grayson become Robin and team up with Batman against this formidable duo. Now we're to question, will Dick Grayson kill Two-Face? And how can Batman and Robin stop the Riddler and Two-Face? That's all the plot I'll mention, so now it's time for me to say what I liked about Batman Forever, what I did not like about Batman Forever, some trivia on my overall opinion on the film. Okay, so what did I like about Batman Forever? The acting to me is a mixed bag, with one performance in particular I'll bring up later in the cons. Val Kimmerer could buy his Bruce Wayne because I felt he pulled off the businessman in his 30s decently enough. However, as Batman, it feels like he's trying a bit too hard to be like Michael Keane's Batman, and I feel he didn't succeed. Chris O'Donnell was pretty good as Robin in that he did make his vengeance against Two-Face somewhat believable, and I felt he worked pretty well with Val Kimmer, especially whenever he talks to Bruce how he wants to help him get revenge on Two-Face. Jim Carrey as the Riddler, for how the character was written, he was perfect for the part. But unfortunately, whenever I see him goofing around on screen, I can't tell the actor from the character. I just see Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. Though having said that, he definitely stole the show here. Nicole Kim as Dr. Chase Meridian, I don't have a lot to say other than she read her lines well enough but her character is really shallow and she didn't have much material to work with. Now, if anyone wants to know my thoughts on Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face, I'll mention that later. There are other people to mention, like Drew Barrymore as one of Two-Face's girlfriends, Sugar, Pat Hingle as Commissioner Gordon, Ed Beagley Jr. as Edward Nigma's boss, Fred Stickley, Michael Goff as Alfred Pennyworth, and even Debbie Mazar as the other girlfriend to Two-Face Spice, but really, aside from saying they are overall decent, I don't have a lot left I can add about the acting. The music by Elliot Golenthal is overall pretty good, though I don't think it's as memorable as Danny Elfman's score, and I don't really have a lot to say about it. I felt he used string, brass, and orchestral music pretty well. One bit I still like is the opening theme, as I felt it was appropriately bombastic for the opening credits, and when Batman suits up to save the day. The production values such as costume design, set design, special effects, etc., just like the acting, I feel is a mixed bag. Some of the miniatures look great for 1995, and some of the CG, though nowadays look pretty outdated by today's standards, look pretty impressive for the time, and I will say the part where Batman is falling from a rooftop to try and catch Two-Face still looks impressive to me, even to this day. I will say the cinematography is also very good in that some of the shots are very low lit. Sure, it sometimes goes overboard with neon and the Batmobile is not subtle in the slightest, but I felt the way it was shot and lit, it felt like its own thing and not an imitation of any of the previous live-action Batman films. Lastly, I will say some of the costume design, while there will definitely be a few things I'll bring up later in the cons, looked okay. One example I will say is the redesign of the Batsuit, ignoring the extra features if you catch my drift. I don't have a lot to say other than it looks close enough to the burn suit. The action scenes I don't really have a lot to say other than they are decently shot and choreographed, though they got a lot more slapsticky with the use of cartoon sound effects. Though to be fair, here it is a bit tame when compared to the next Batman film directed by Joel Schumacher. I will say this though, I felt it was a bit more innovative than the ones of the burn films with how they're shot, though as far as the final confrontation with Two-Face and the Riddler goes, I'll bring my thoughts of that later. The directed by Joel Schumacher is overall okay. There's nothing here I saw as incompetent, 
but I wouldn't say it was anything spectacular either. The way the actors were directed I felt was decent with the exception of Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face, plus I felt he made it look like a comic book brought to the big screen, but in a different way than the Tim Burton films. With the Tim Burton films, I felt he got the feeling through its surreal atmosphere, whereas here it's obviously brighter and more colorful, but I felt he used camera angles, most notably Dutch angles, pretty effectively, and he thankfully didn't overuse them. And it was pretty decently paced, though there is one deleted scene I wish they kept in, which I'll bring up with my next and last pro to Batman Forever. Lastly, the overall story is decent, though mostly forgettable, and there are a few things about it that bug me, which I'll bring up later in the cons. And sure, it is incredibly cheesy worth saying it's brighter and more colorful than Batman Returns would be quite the understatement. But I felt it had some really good ideas, most notably when we flash back to Bruce's childhood, where he blames himself for the death of his parents, and in a deleted scene, they showed that his parents originally didn't want to go to the theater, but Bruce insisted that they go, so he thinks had he not asked them to go to the theater, then they would have still been alive. And that parallels how Dick Grayson feels about the death of his parents, and I felt had that scene been in the final product, it would have been a proper payoff to that idea, and would have been a very fitting piece to Bruce's character arc, and that it would give it a lot more weight than what we got in the end. I also felt the interaction between Dick and Bruce after Dick wants Batman to help him get his revenge on Two-Face by killing him to be actually pretty interesting. Now for some of the things I did not like about Batman Forever. I will say I did not like Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face largely because it felt like a Joker knockoff. Now before I explain why I didn't like this portrayal, I want to say this. I think not only is Tommy Lee Jones a great actor, but for the time he could have made a great Two-Face, and to be fair to him, I don't really blame him for the performance as I felt the character was badly written. Plus, the direction didn't help, Madison. Sure, you could argue he's insane, but from what I know of Two-Face, he is supposed to have a duality problem, much like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and the coin is the deciding factor in his decisions. But it's never conveyed very effectively, because I never once got the impression that he had more than one personality, and throughout the film, really, all he does is flip a coin and laugh a lot. One scene in particular that felt really out of character for Two-Face is the scene where him and the Riddler are in Wayne Manor, and while the Riddler and Two-Face's goons are causing destruction to not just the Batcave, but also Wayne Manor, he kept on flipping the coin until he got the side he wanted it and shoots Bruce Wayne, when it's like he would have flipped the coin and whatever it came up as made his decision there, and it doesn't help that he's done this just about every other time he's flipped a coin and made his decision on whatever it hit. So to me, that stuck out like a sore thumb. Let's say I'll say it also doesn't help matters that his backstory and motivation I feel is rather flimsy and not laid out or even well thought out at all. As I mentioned earlier, some of the costume design did look okay, but then we have a few that I don't care for, like the Riddler's outfit. The first costume the Riddler wore looked fine enough, but when he has tights on, it looks terrible, and I will admit I'm not a huge fan of the design of Batman's newest suit and Robin's suit, and no, not because of the extra features on them, but because the problem to me is I never once got the impression that they're armored, especially the Batman suit. Also, while the Batwing and the Batboat were nice to see, besides sending the characters from point A to point B and getting blown up, they never really served a purpose in the story. While I said the action scenes were overall decent, I felt the climax with Two-Face and the Riddler was a real letdown, as I felt they were defeated way too easily. I found it disappointing that the Riddler and or Two-Face didn't really have a confrontation with Batman, whether it was a fistfight or a battle of the minds. Also, I wish Two-Face actually lived and was sent to Arkham Asylum, because it would have completed Dick Grayson's character arc better than have him fall to his death. Especially when earlier in the film, Dick actually saved Two-Face from falling to his death, preferring to see him in jail. Lastly, while I said the overall story has some good ideas and is pretty decent, there are some aspects that either don't add up or just does not make sense, such as when the Riddler uses a giant laser-looking thing to blow up the Batwing, what on earth is he even using? Brainwaves? If so, since when can brainwaves be used as a giant laser? If putting the box stick thing on makes the Riddler smarter, then why doesn't it make Two-Face smarter, especially when we see he puts the thing on more than once? I also felt they solved the Riddler's riddles a bit too easily, and when they pieced everything together, that Edward Digma's the Riddler, it took Bruce and Alfred all of like 30 seconds to figure it out. If Bruce thought Meridia was in trouble, why not tell the police, considering they were in the police department, rather than break down the door and make him suspicious? If the Batcave said intruder alert, you'd think the first idea would be to hide everything so that in case it was an enemy who wants Batman's blood on his hands, not show off the computer, even the Batmobile, and if it was people barging into Wayne Manor, then I would have let that slide, but given it happened when Dick Grayson discovered the Batcave, back when Bruce Wayne was still Batman, I have to ask, why on earth would you even do that? It's just these kinds of issues, nitpicks, and serious story problems 
that really do add up after a while and start to overshadow the good qualities of the film. Now for some trivia. Batman Forever was nominated for three Oscars as it was up for Best Cinematography, Best Sound Editing, and Best Sound Mixing. Plus the U2 song Hold Me, Throw Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me was up for not just the Golden Globe for Best Original Song, but it was also up for the Razzie for Worst Original Song. Well, I said Marlon Williams was originally cast as Robin for Batman Returns before they chose to hold off the character for another film. There were other people that were considered for the part before ultimately Chris O'Donnell was casted. From what I gathered, a few names include Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Corey Haim, Corey Feldman, Toby Stevens, Ewan McGregor, and even Mark Wahlberg. Before Nicole Kimmel was cast as Dr. Chase Meridian, there were several actresses that were rumored to be in the running, including Sandra Bullock, Sidney Crawford, and at one point they cast Rene Russo back when Michael Keane was still attached to the project, but when he dropped out because he didn't like the direction Joel Schumacher was taking the franchise, they deemed her too old to play the part, and so it was given to Nicole Kidman. Prior to Nicole Kidman being cast as Dr. Chase Meridian, Joel Schumacher actually wanted Nicole Kidman to play the role of Poison Ivy, but he decided that Two-Face, the Riddler, and Poison Ivy would be too many villains, and so Poison Ivy was saved for the sequel. It's been reported that the personality clashes between Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey annoyed Joel Schumacher so much that he had said he never wanted to work with those two ever again until 12 years later when Joel Schumacher directed the film The Number 23, which starred Jim Carrey. And apparently there are clashes between Joel Schumacher and Val Kilmer while they were filming. And from what I gathered, things got so bad that Val Kilmer wouldn't talk to Joel Schumacher for like two weeks. According to the trivia page on IMDb, before Val Kilmer was cast as Batman, other names that are considered for the role from what I can find included Daniel Day-Lewis, Kurt Russell, Alec Baldwin, Ethan Hawke, Ray Fiennes, Tom Hanks, and even Johnny Depp. The director of the film is Joel Schumacher, who also directed The Lost Boys, The Client, Falling Down, Phone Booth, and even the 2004 adaptation of The Phantom of the Opera. Some of the other roles that cast were includes Val Kimmer, who you might know as Lieutenant Tom Iceman Kazansky from Top Gun, Moses and God from the second film ever made by DreamWorks Animation, as well as the first traditionally animated film, The Prince of Egypt, Bravo from Planes, the voice of Kit from the 2008 revival of Knight Rider, and yes, he was even Dr. Montgomery from the 1996 film adaptation of The Island of Dr. Moreau. Tommy Lee Jones, who also played Clay Shaw from JFK, where he was nominated for the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, Marshall Samuel Gerald from The Fugitive, where he not only won the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor, but also the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor as well, Sheriff Ed Bell from the 2007 film adaptation of No Country for Old Men, Thaddeus Stevens from Lincoln, where he was nominated for the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, Colonel Chester Phillips from Captain America the First Avenger, and he was even Agent K from the Men in Black trilogy, Jim Carrey also played Ace Ventura from not only Ace Ventura Pet Detective, but also his 1995 sequel Ace Ventura When Nature Calls, Truman Burbank from The Truman Show, Lloyd Christmas from Dumb and Dumber and its upcoming sequel, Dumb and Dumber 2. The Grinch from Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. The Mask from, well, The Mask. Horn from the 2008 film adaptation of Horn and Here's a Who. And yes, he was even Colonel Stars and Stripes from Kick-Ass 2. Lastly, we have Nicole Kimmon, who also played Santine from Moulin Rouge, where she not only won the Golden Globe for Best Actress, Musical, or Comedy, but she was also up for the Academy Award for Best Actress. Grace Stewart from The Others, where she was nominated for the Golden Globe for Best Actress Drama. Becca Corbett from Rabbit Hole, where she was not only nominated for the Golden Globe for Best Actress Drama, but also the Academy Award for Best Actress as well. And she was even Virginia Woolf from The Hours, where she won both the Golden Globe for Best Actress Drama and the Academy Award for Best Actress. Overall, Batman Forever is a pretty entertaining, though forgettable film. The problem is, for every good thing I could say about it, there's a problem that really does hurt the film. Some of the acting is decent, but then we also have some terrible performances. The story has some really good ideas, and had it had proper payoff, could have gave it some real weight, but then there are moments that just don't make any sense, and I can't help but feel they're just dumbing it down to appeal to a wider audience. The directing's overall alright, the cinematography is great, and most of the technicals looked good for the time, but for the most part looks pretty outdated. Now, I will be honest, when I was a kid, I remember liking the Schumacher films more than the Tim Burton Batman films, because I like that it was light-hearted, and that leads to my next point. Would I recommend this film to people? If you have younger kids and you thought the Tim Burton films were too dark and want to introduce them to the character of Batman in a different way, then I will say this film, while forgettable, is overall harmless, as it does not have too graphic of violence or explicit sex, and I feel the best word to describe it is harmless. 
because I did not really see anything that was insulting even to children's intelligence. Still, as a film on its own merits, I feel Batman Forever is just average. It does have good elements to it, and that I will not deny, but it also has many things that really do hurt the film, and like I said, it's mostly forgettable. I give Batman Forever 2 stars out of 4, and a 5 out of 10. So that's my review of Batman Forever. If you want to express your opinion on the film, you're more than welcome to, but I ask you to please be civil about it. Any bashing and or personal attacks on anyone will be removed the minute I see them, and it will result in a block, which is the last thing I want to do. So that's my review of Batman Forever. I hope you have a wonderful day, and not only that, but till next time as I look at not only the worst Batman film, but also what is arguably one of the worst superhero films ever made. Hello everyone, and welcome to my review of easily one of the most infamous superhero films of all time, Batman and Robin. Let's talk about the film, shall we? So the story shows Batman, played by George Clooney, and Robin, played once again by Chris O'Donnell, suit up to combat a villain named Mr. Freeze who has been stealing the largest diamonds in Gotham, and he eventually escapes after he freezes Robin and Batman chooses to save him over chasing Mr. Freeze. We then cut to a lab in South America where we are introduced to Dr. Pamela Isley, played by Uma Thurman, who discovers her colleague, Dr. Jason Woodrow, creates the muscle-bound villain Bane through a super soldier serum called Venom and plans on auctioning him to a bunch of dictators. After she refuses to join, Woodrow decides on attempting to kill Isley by pushing her to a table of chemicals as well as Venom. Of course, that doesn't kill her as she becomes poison ivy and kills Richard with a poisonous kiss and takes Bane with her. We find out Mr. Freeze was Dr. Victor Freeze, who two years ago, his wife was diagnosed with a rare disease called McGregor Syndrome, so he put her in cryogenic sleep to find a cure, which over time he has found a cure in the earliest stages of the disease, when after an accident he fell into liquids that was 50 degrees below zero, where he somehow survived, but it mutated his body to where he could only survive in sub-zero weather, and his suit is powered by diamonds. Because of this, Bruce Wayne plans on putting the Wayne Diamonds on auction in order to lure him, and of course we see Mr. Freeze plans on using all the giant diamonds he stole to freeze all of Gotham for ransom, so he can find a cure for his wife. Eventually we are introduced to Alfred C's Barbara, played by Alicia Silverstone, who mentions that her parents were killed in a car accident and Alfred was taking care of her since. Also, she came from Oxbridge and Bruce Wayne chooses to let her stay. At the auction, Poison Ivy, while dressed in a monkey suit, pops up and with the use of pheromone dust, not only has Batman and Robin go gaga over her, but also fighting over her as well. Eventually, Mr. Freeze pops up again, taking the diamonds, and after a chase scene, Batman captures and places him in Arkham Asylum, which causes Robin to be angry at Batman, and while that is going on, Alfred is suffering from stage 1 of McGregor Syndrome and is dying. While at Arkham Asylum, Poison Ivy and Bane break Mr. Freeze out and plan on teaming together to not only combat Batman and Robin, but also to make the world starting with Gotham a winter wasteland by using the giant telescope at the Gotham Observatory as a giant freezing gun where everyone dies except them and the plants, including Poison Ivy's mutant plants. As the film progresses, Barbara turns into Batgirl and helps Batman and Robin confront this trio. Now to the question, will Batman find the cure that Freeze made for Stage 1 McGregor Syndrome to save Alfred's life? Lastly, how can Batman, Robin, and Batgirl stop Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy, and Bane? That's all the plot I'll mention, so now it's time for me to say what I liked about Batman and Robin, what I did not like about Batman and Robin, some trivia my overall opinion on the film. Now, while there are a ton of problems with the film, and believe me, we'll get there soon, was there anything I liked about Batman and Robin? The casting on paper for the most part looked great, and some of the acting is not bad, with praise going to Michael Goff as Alfred, because I felt he showed the pain he was going through as he was dying with this disease pretty well, and George Clooney on paper seemed like a great choice for Batman, and to be fair to him, I think he was one of the least bad performances of the bunch. Sure, he doesn't even remotely try to hide his voice whenever he's Batman. However, I feel that way because I felt he had pretty decent chemistry with Michael Goff. The music by Elliot Goldenthal is once again pretty good. Like with Batman Forever, I felt he used brass and orchestral music pretty well, and I thought he used choir in some of the scenes involving Mr. Freeze and even his wife was pretty well done as it demonstrated different emotions ranging from epic like during the final battle when they show the observatory once Mr. Freeze used its telescope as a freezer gun to even sadness like the scenes with Nora Freeze. Some of the effects for the time looked okay by 1997 standards, such as whenever Mr. Freeze freezes people, though nowadays it looks really outdated. And make no mistake, you'll see me mention the visuals later. But if there is one thing in the technicals I could give credit for, is that the miniatures again look pretty impressive because they show some real size and scope to Gotham City. Lastly, while you'll see me mention the overall story later, 
I will say one idea they had here had some serious potential to give it some real weight, which was while Alfred is dying, he has a conversation with Bruce Wayne how you can't control or stop death and victory comes in what we know is right. And just the idea that could have been really interesting. Now for the things I did not like about Batman and Robin. Oh dear God, where do I begin? Well, I'm just going to be blunt with what I feel is easily one of the biggest problems with Batman and Robin. And that is the script sucked. The acting I can't necessarily blame because they're given such horrendous material to work with. One example I thought was a real light that was all the development they gave Robin and Batman forever went to waste, as the character became annoyingly unlikable because of how whiny he was. And I don't think it was really Chris O'Donnell's fault, as the character was terribly written, and the directing didn't help matters as well. And while I thought George Colleen had pretty good chemistry with Michael Goff, the same cannot be said when George Colleen was on screen with Chris O'Donnell, as I felt they did not mesh well together on screen at all. I also felt they did a terrible job at picking the audience. Given how lighthearted and goofy it was, you'd think they were trying to market it at a younger audience, and I have no problem with that. If you want to make a movie marketed for kids, then make a movie marketed for kids. But then they have innuendos that kids will not get, with one example being with Batman and Robin talk about poison ivy stems and buds. Lastly, some scenes just felt like they were dumping exposition, which comes off as lazy. With one example being when we were first introduced to Barbara, just the writing is overall horrendous in this movie. While I said some of the visuals looked okay by 1997 standards, there are moments where it looked really cheap, such as some scenes where the icicles start wobbling, most notably this scene when a Gotham police officer is opening his door, and given it had a 120 to $125 million budget, I feel that is inexcusable. It makes me wonder, where on earth did that money go? The costume design as a whole I think looks terrible here, and I would go as far as to say it's the worst done as far as the live-action Batman films from 1989 to 2012, because none of it looked like something that Batman, Robin, and even Batgirl would wear as it more felt like stuff you would see in action figures, especially their frosted suits which come out of nowhere, as well as the newest vehicles they drive during the final fight. And I also didn't care for Mr. Freeze's suit because it just made him look cartoony and not intimidating in the slightest. The action scenes, while they were shot alright even if they went a bit overboard with the stunts to where it makes you wonder if Gotham City is made of trampolines, it got so slapsticky and in some scenes used cartoon sound effects so much that not only did it come off as lame even when they were fighting the main villains, but also after a while it got so ridiculous that it couldn't get much worse if they started to do things like trip on banana peels or throw pies at each other's faces. Not to mention, and this was a point I was saving for this movie especially, it's amazing how incompetent Commissioner Gordon and the Gotham Police got, as you can remove Commissioner Gordon from the film altogether, and with the exception of Poison Ivy gaining the keys to the bat signal, literally nothing would change. And the police were so useless that it makes me wonder how they could stop a jaywalker without asking Batman for help. The villains I could not take seriously at all. Bane was a joke, as literally the only purpose he had was to be a brainless henchman to Poison Ivy. Speaking of Poison Ivy, all she does is spouts out terrible puns, and I never really got a sense of menace out of her. And while on paper Uma Thurman seemed like a great choice for Poison Ivy, and I could see she tried with the material she was given, which was horrendous. Her line delivery in some scenes were terrible, such as the scene that led to the creation of Poison Ivy as she was talked to Dr. Woodrow. Not to mention that scene came off as rushed, so I had a hard time sympathizing with Poison Ivy, because prior to that, we never really got to know her at all. And Mr. Freeze literally just about all of his lines has something to do with ice or cold, and they do give him a backstory, which again could have been great if done well, but unfortunately, like Poison Ivy, it comes off as rushed, and I have a hard time sympathizing with them. Plus, it's not exactly the smoothest transition to go from a guy who's trying to find a cure to save his wife from a rare disease, then have him show up in a bodysuit and spout cheesy ice pun after cheesy ice pun, and even do something completely silly like having his henchmen sing the Snow Miser song from the year without a Santa Claus, and even his hideout's not subtle in the slightest. Plus, I felt Arnold Schwarzenegger was a terrible casting choice for Mr. Freeze, as I never bought him as a doctor, and I never bought the dramatic elements regarding his wife, since it wasn't well done at all. Not just from an acting perspective, but also a writing and a directing perspective as well. While I said the directing by Joel Schumacher was okay in Batman Forever, I felt it got a lot worse here. Before I explain why I think he did a bad job, I might as well bring up the elephant of the room, which is he did apologize for making this movie, and I will say whether I accept it or not in my overall thoughts on the movie. With that said, I felt he did a terrible job here because I felt he used Dutch or tilted camera angles way too much and it ruined the effect that those shots should do. 
To add to that, some camera effects are just weird in a really bad way and just adds to the cheapness of the film, which again, given the budget, is inexcusable. Like during the final fight with Poison Ivy where Robin is trying to escape from some plants while being trapped in a fountain where he comes up for air and then they do this bizarre rewind thing where he's all of a sudden back in. I feel that scene speaks for itself and how bad that looks. Another example I thought was not only a result of bad directing, but also bad acting was when we are first introduced to Barbara, they said she came back from England where she was studying and yet there's not even an attempt to give it a British accent. I also felt the pacing was really sluggish in a bad way, as for a movie that's a little over two hours long, it felt much longer because some scenes have felt dragged on for a bit too long. Let's see, while I said the overall story had one part that had some serious potential to be actually dramatic, it's bogged down by lousy execution and a lot of things do not make a lick of sense, such as Mr. Freeze's plan to freeze Gotham for ransom, which he plans to use the money to fund his research to find a cure to save his wife, which on paper doesn't sound like a bad motivation, but the reason why it doesn't make sense is because you'd think he would cash in the massive diamonds, which are easily several million dollars per diamond, and he had like, what, a dozen giant diamonds? I also felt like Barbara didn't really have much of a reason to be Batgirl. Sure, it made sense for Dick and Bruce to be superheroes as their parents were taken from them by a homicidal maniac, whereas Barbara's parents died in an accident. And what led to the creation of Batgirl I thought was stupid, where Alfred gives her a disc to give to his brother and tells her not to look at it, of course, she breaks that promise and looks at it, which for a security password, you'd think it would block her access after like the third try she typed a password. And once she figured out Batman and Robin's true identity, Alfred not only knew she would do that, but it was also made a new suit and even new gadgets. Okay, I can let him being a Taylor slide considering he did Robin's suit in the last film, but him designing all these gadgets I felt was going too far. Not to mention, why give someone a suit when she barely has any knowledge in hand-to-hand -hand combat? Just the story overall was a colossal mess. Now for some trivia. Batman and Robin was up for the most Razzies out of any of the Batman films where it was nominated for 11 Razzies, which are Worst Picture, Worst Supporting Actor for Chris O'Donnell and Arnold Schwarzenegger, Worst Supporting Actress for Uma Thurman and Alicia Silverstone actually won that award, Worst Screen Couple for George Clooney and Chris O'Donnell, Worst Remake or Sequel, Worst Director for Joel Schumacher, Worst Screenplay, Worst Original Song for the Smashing Pumpkin song The End is the Beginning is the End, and it was nominated for the one-time Razzie Award of Worst Reckless Regard for Human Life and Public Property. There were plans of a sequel called Batman Triumphant, which from what I understand was going to have Scarecrow, the Joker is a hallucination due to the Scarecrow's fear toxin, the Mad Hatter, and even Harley Quinn as Joker's daughter, but given the poor box office numbers of Batman and Robin, that idea was scrapped. Over the years, there were other ideas, including an adaptation of Batman Year One, Batman vs. Superman, and even a live-action film adaptation of Batman Beyond, but all of it got scrapped, and it would be eight years until the series was rebooted with the Dark Knight trilogy directed by Christopher Nolan. Apparently, Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't the only person who was considered to play the part of Mr. Freeze, as I heard Anthony Hopkins, Patrick Stewart, Sylvester Stallone, and even Hulk Hogan were also considered for the role of Mr. Freeze. From what I gathered, there are other actresses that are in the running for the role of Poison Ivy, including Julia Roberts, Sharon Stone, Demi Moore, and Joel Schumacher originally wanted Nicole Kidman to play the part, but she was cast as the part of Dr. Chase Moretti in the previous film. Plus, according to IMDb, apparently Christina Ricci was considered for the role of Batgirl. This is the only Batman film distributed by Warner Brothers where none of the villains died, and it's the only modern Batman film where Bruce's girlfriend doesn't figure out he's Batman. Sadly, the actor who played Bane, Robert Jeep Swenson, passed away two months after the film's release due to heart failure. He was only 40 years old. Some of the other roles that cast were includes George Clooney, who you might know as Dr. Doug Ross from ER, Bob Barnes from Syriana, where he won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, Danny Ocean from the Oceans Trilogy, Ryan Bingham from Up in the Air, where he was nominated for the Oscar for Best Actor, Matt King from The Descendants, where he was again nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actor, Mr. Fox from the 2009 Academy Award-nominated film adaptation of Fantastic Mr. Fox, and he was even Matt Kowalski from the Academy Award-winning film Gravity, Chris O'Donnell, who played D.R. Tegan from the Dizzy version of The Three Musketeers, Ordo Palmieri from Kinsey, and G. Collin from NCIS Los Angeles. Arnold Schwarzenegger, who you might know as the Terminator from the first three Terminator films and the upcoming sequel Terminator Genesis, Conan from both Conan the Barbarian and its sequel Conan the Destroyer, Trench Mauser from the Expendables trilogy, and he was even Colonel John Matrix from Commando. Lastly, we have Uma Thurman, who also played the Bride from both volumes of Kill Bill, Mia Walls from Pulp Fiction, where she was nominated for the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. 
Fontaine from the 1998 film adaptation of Les Miserables, and she was even Kushana from the 2005 Disney dub of Hayao Miyazaki's second film, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Overall, it's easy to see why people think Batman and Robin is one of, if not the worst superhero movie ever made, or at the very least one of the most notorious, because it is a terrible movie, and is a prime example of why the merchandise should be the byproduct of the movie, and not the other way around. The cats pretty much overact their way through. Some of the special effects look inexcusably cheap. I couldn't take the villain seriously. The action scenes were pretty lame. The writing was horrendous. The directing was bad. And the overall story was just a mess and felt rushed. Now I know what some people might ask me. Do I accept Joel Schumacher's apology? And my answer is yes I do. Because it does take a good amount of guts to admit your own mistake. And I appreciate that he did just that. Now, I will be honest, when I was a kid, this was the Batman film I watched the most. And who knows, if it wasn't for Batman and Robin being a flop at the box office, for all we know, the Dark Knight trilogy might have never even existed. And that leads to this question, would I recommend this film? I would, under one circumstance. And that is, if you want to get together with a bunch of friends that you want to riff on a terrible movie, because this movie is a goldmine for riffing material. And I can see why people enjoy this movie in a terrible B-movie kind of way. And I feel that's the best way to describe this movie. It's really bad, don't get me wrong, but it was entertainingly bad. And I'd much rather want it to be entertainingly bad than a movie so bad it's boring. So I guess there's that. But regardless, Batman and Robin is one giant stinker. I give Batman and Robin one star out of four and a three and a half or 3.5 out of 10. So that's my review of Batman and Robin. If you want to express your opinion on the film, you're more than welcome to, but I ask you to please be mature about it. Any bashing and or personal attacks on anyone will be removed the minute I see them, and you'll be blocked, and trust me, that is the absolute last thing I want to do to anyone. So that's my review of Batman and Robin. Hope you have a nice day, not only that, but see you all next time as I look at the second and final animated Batman film I'll tackle.